In the pandemonium of the First World War, the Russia of the Tsars that had seemed to be eternal, now bled dry by battles and tortured by hunger, is gripped by revolution. For an entire people, hope is reborn. But the dream will not last. As chaos spreads across the country, a handful of men seize power and change the destiny of mankind. Winter has whitened the tundra and frozen the hearts of men. The terrible Russian winter that stirs up the pangs of torture has returned. For nearly three years, the Great War has cast its shadow over Europe. On the Eastern Front, Imperial Russia is fighting Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Enemy offensives have wiped out many of Russia's troops. There are hundreds of thousands of casualties. The army of the Tsar, long believed to be invincible, soon shows signs of weakness. There are shortages of shells, ammunition, and equipment. In London and in Paris, the Allies are beginning to doubt whether Russia can hold out in these conditions. Then, one morning, news from the Russian capital only increases their anxiety. Petrograd, 19th of February. These last few days, there have been endless queues at the bakeries. There's a shortage of flour. You can hear the crowds complaining. The women are shivering with cold. The children are passing out. Since the start of the conflict, Claude Anet, the correspondent of the newspaper Le Petit Parisien, has been describing in his columns the mood of the city of the Tsars. Witness to these alarming scenes, the French journalist hasn't the slightest inkling that they are the precursors to the greatest upheaval of the 20th century. Only yesterday, foreign observers were speaking of Imperial Russia as an invulnerable giant. With 14 million men under arms, she stood as a rock for her allies. In a Europe swept by war, the Romanov dynasty, in power for three centuries, manifested complete confidence in the face of adversity. Power and stability had attracted investors. Day after day, with the influx of capital, factories sprang from the earth. In just a few years, Russia had entered the modern era. But this sudden development conceals hidden realities. Despite the colossal production of the agricultural land, the farmers can barely survive. Having just emerged from centuries of serfdom, they slave away in filth, poverty, and cholera. In the towns, the workers who are still often punished with the whip are shamelessly exploited. The great writer Maxim Gorky bears witness for them. Day after day, all our life, we are worked to death in the mud. 
we're cheated while others stuff themselves and have fun at the expense of our suffering and control us like dogs on a chain. Our life is a night, a long, dark night. But the voice of this suppressed anger is not heard. Nicholas II, Tsar of all the Russias, is lord and master of his 160 million subjects. His only concession to the times is the creation of a parliament, the Duma, an assembly of prominent citizens devoid of power in the face of his, which has no bounds. The Tsar has deprived his country of any political life. He systematically uses violent means to put down popular uprisings. His will is law. At the beginning of 1917, those opposing the regime waged their political struggle from abroad. Among the more active of those exiles, some are already famous. Lev Davidovich Bronstein, whose nom de guerre was Leon Trotsky, has escaped from Siberia. Deported from several European countries because of his pacifist convictions, he has settled in the United States. He tirelessly militates for the union of proletariats throughout the world. Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, known as Lenin, has found haven in Switzerland. An international figure of Marxist philosophy, he has been fighting autocracy for 30 years. His entire being is devoted to a single aim, a single idea, a single passion, revolution. Even though, when disillusioned, he stated, The older ones among us will certainly not live long enough to see it. And yet, it is in the imperial capital, the St. Petersburg of today, that history is about to change. From either side of the river Neva, two worlds confront each other. On the south side beats the heart of the power, while the workers' suburbs are on the north. All revolutions begin with bread. Petrograd has enough supplies for just another 10 days. The time for rationing is at hand. Petrograd, 20th of February. Things are going no better. In the early hours of an icy dawn, my cook waited four hours to get two bread rolls. Following the severe transport crisis, not enough coal is getting through. The factories working for national defense have had to cut production or close down. Such is the case of the Putilov Arms Factory, situated in the popular quarter of Viborg, one of the country's industrial bastions. Because of the lack of raw materials, 24,000 workers are thrown onto the streets. It is the fear of the future that lights the powder keg. Comrades, if we cannot obtain an honest loaf of bread, we will solve our problem by force if necessary, shouts one worker. The unrest spreads and very soon overwhelms the district. The gray hordes from the suburbs surge toward the heart of the city, demanding emergency measures. Everyone is expecting a reaction from the Tsar. 
but the Tsar is in Mogilev, more than 700 kilometers from Petrograd. Nicholas II has taken over command of military operations to inspire his troops. He believes that war can still unite his people around the crown, whereas in fact it stirs up tension and rancor. In his absence, the Empress Alexandra deluges her husband with reassuring letters. The unrest does not concern her in the slightest. May God bless you and help you to see our valiant soldiers at close hand. Your presence will give them strength and courage. Never fear for what you have left behind you. My love, I am here. Don't laugh at your old and foolish wife. She wears invisible trousers. But in the capital, new disturbances are brewing. To stem them, the bridges that link the two parts of the city are raised. The working class suburbs are cut off from the town center. But the authorities have overlooked one detail. At this time of year, the Neva freezes over. And on International Women's Day, thousands of wives, mothers and daughters walk across the frozen river to parade through the upper class districts. A crowd of bystanders watches this peaceful protest. The next day, the 24th of February, the demonstrations swell. Factories go on strike. More than 200,000 people take to the streets. The protests take on a decidedly political tone. Hundreds of groups are gathering. Meetings are improvised. Outside the station, orators harangue the crowd, shouting, down with the government down with the war. I'm even hearing down with the Tsar. The situation can change at any minute and become serious. The revolution is underway. Far from Petrograd, in the headquarters of the armed forces, Nicholas II has just received an irate letter from the Tsarina. My love, what frightful times we live in. Low-born girls are running around shouting that they have no bread, simply to create a disturbance. At the same time, some workers are preventing others from working. God has given you a very heavy cross to bear. But stand firm. Show your authority. That's what the Russians need. Let them feel the weight of your fist. The Tsar is determined to settle the problem from a distance. His telegram is categorical. I have ordered the disturbances to be put down by force before tomorrow. So the army and the police now resist the demonstrators, who refuse to disperse. The soldiers open fire. The crowds panic and run. There are many dead and wounded. Very quickly, the center of Petrograd takes on the appearance of a camp under siege. Fighting rages all afternoon. First aid vehicles are operating around the clock. In one hospital alone, 300 wounded have been taken in. That night, in Petrograd's barracks, feelings are running high. Most of the soldiers are small farmers, craftsmen, or laborers, forced by the war to serve under the banner of the Tsar. 
one after another. Shocked at having been ordered to fire at their brothers, they mutiny and join the ranks of the insurgents. Cut off from the real world, the Tsar disregards the alarming telegrams that his general staff received from the capital. On the morning of the 27th of February, the French journalist is transfixed by the scenes in the street. There is non-stop shooting. The soldiers are firing in the air. They're heading for the nearby arsenal, and I'm following them. They're laying siege to it. I can see them giving guns to the workers. It's incredible to watch. Around 40,000 rifles and 30,000 revolvers are handed out. The same day, Nicholas II at last makes up his mind to return to the capital, determined to quell the rebellion. But the Imperial train can't get through. Using destroyed bridges and unusable tracks as a pretext, the railway workers keep rerouting the train. Meanwhile, in Petrograd, Nicholas II's power is crumbling. Beneath the golden tints of the Taurid Palace, the members of the Duma rise up against the Tsar. During an extraordinary session, they declare their autonomy. In a neighboring hall, soldiers and workers form an assembly. As an emergency measure, they elect 600 delegates to represent them the Petrograd Soviet. That evening, in a wave of enthusiasm, all these men forge their destiny. Twenty-eighth of February, outside the entrance to the Taurid Palace, the crowd is so dense that I can hardly get through. Here I am at the center of the Russian Revolution. Armed soldiers everywhere, a few civilians. Empty food tins on the ground, packets of cigarettes. The debris left by 2,000 men who spent the night here. One of them said to me, do you see all that we've done in one day? Immense joy everywhere. People are embracing each other. The soldiers are happy and triumphant. From now on, there is no longer any support for the Tsar. He is still blocked in his train in the middle of the steps. Worse still, aware that a page has been turned, his general staff encourage him to abdicate for the good of Russia. Resigned to the situation, Nicholas II gives up the throne. It's a triumph for the revolution. The Romanov dynasty that yesterday reigned over 160 million subjects has disappeared in the tumult. All it needed was for a few regiments to go over to the people's side in Petrograd, the capital, for the masters of this colossal empire to retreat into the shadows. It's astonishing to see that the revolution has been accepted right across the country. The will of the people has just made history. The international press announces it's coming. 
In Paris, La Victoire enthusiastically announces, It's the greatest event in the history of the world since the French Revolution. The Times of London declares, This profound change inaugurates an era of freedom and progress for mankind. In New York, for Leon Trotsky, revolution means amnesty. He enthusiastically set sail to go back home. But his return to war-torn Europe will take longer than expected. And on the banks of Lake Zurich, where he takes a stroll every day, Lenin exclaims when he hears the news. Amazing, incredible. So unexpected. Convinced that this first stage of the revolution will not be the last, he decides he must return home at all costs. But who is expecting him in Russia? For now, Petrograd is mourning its dead. February's victims are buried in the heart of the capital. Over a million people have come to pay their last respects. Claude Anet is impressed by the scale of the ceremony. The groups marching in front of me are very mixed. There are militiamen with white armbands and rifles on their shoulders. There are bourgeoisie. There are soldiers but the numberless crowd is made up of working men and women. The women pass by, their woolen scarves around their heads in the fashion of the women of the people. This flood of people flows slowly and steadily, stopping briefly from one side to the other of the Champ de Mars, and their black shapes stand out in mass against the white of the snow. On this first public holiday of the new Russia, all the actors of the revolution have answered the call. Conservatives and socialists, aristocrats and commoners, have all contributed to overturning a regime that thought itself eternal. But now they have to govern. And under the dome of the Tauride Palace, reconcile two visions of the future. On one side, there are the members of the Duma, who want a Russia that is capitalist and liberal. On the other, there is the new assembly that has come out of the revolution, the Soviet. With a socialist majority, its delegates aspire to a world of justice and equality. After lengthy negotiations, the two sides agree to form a provisional government with a liberal majority. Alexander Kerensky, a moderate socialist, is the main architect of this compromise. Named Minister of Justice, he is the man that the revolution throws up out of the ranks. His ambition will do the rest. This government's primary aim is simple, to establish liberty. Decree number one is immediately enacted. The abolition of corporal punishment in the army gives back the soldier his dignity. From being a subject, he becomes a full citizen. On the front, the men celebrate their new status. In a few weeks, spectacular measures are put into place. They break definitively with the old ways. Freedom of association, of expression, of the press, a general amnesty, abolition of the death penalty, universal suffrage. Everywhere, people's councils are set up. There is no town in Russia without its Soviet, where the population expresses its grievances sets out its demands. 
The country dreams of being the freest in the world. From Vladivostok to Murmansk, and from Tashkent to Odessa, the mosaic of oppressed peoples that had composed the empire are now demanding autonomy. In the countryside, the peasants rejoice. They claimed a right to a plot of land large enough to feed the mouths living on it. Yet just a few months earlier, they were still living under the yoke. The promise of a better life is emerging for the working class too. Soon, wages would no longer be miserable. 40 hours of work a week would become the rule and job security would be guaranteed. In the spring of 1917, the banners proclaim, for a democratic republic, for peace, for the land and power to the people. Hope is boundless.